Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk and this is episode 105 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a great discussion with Joy and Bowden Overstreet for this episode. And Joy is a widowed parent and she is in fact the person who's the farthest out from their loss that we've had on the show. She was widowed 47 years ago when her kids were just three and six years old. And I think it's really helpful to hear her perspectives and her reflections so many years, uh, so many years later. So we talk about everything from the shock of finding out her 29 year old husband was diagnosed with cancer when her kids were just one and four years old. Uh, all the way up through the discussions that she's planning and hoping to have now with her adult kids 47 years later about things that they never, for one reason or another, had a chance to talk about um, at the time or in all these ensuing years, and realizing that it's actually never too late to have these conversations. So I hope you will have a listen to her reflections, and I hope you enjoy my discussion with Joy and Bowden Overstreet. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Widowed Parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Widowed Parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Joy Imboden Overstreet. Joy is a widowed parent with many years of experience and reflection under her belt. She's joining us today from Portland, Oregon. Joy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored. And I think that so many parents who have become widowed just don't know what to do or where to turn. So having the perspective of all the people that you've interviewed over the years is really invaluable. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, I've really been looking forward to speaking with you. And one reason I think is because you really do have a unique perspective. I mean, I'll say right up front for listeners, you're 81 years old, you're almost 50 years out from having lost your husband way back in 1974. So I think that this is a really unique chance to talk with a fellow widowed parent um, who can really share with us. You know, I hear from listeners all the time that they feel alone, right, in their experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I love talking with other widowed parents who can reflect. And um, I think probably the widowed parent, you know, before you today, the person who's been the farthest out from their loss has maybe been in the 10 to 15 year range. Um, So this is just terrific. I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing from you and hearing all your perspectives here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, um, My husband died. Well, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer, which at Mm. the time was um, pretty deadly, actually. The the prognosis was not good Uh, in 1972, so two years before he died. Mm. And he had just gone in for a biopsy for a questionable lump in his testicle, but the doctor never mentioned any possibility of that it might be cancer. So when he came out after this long surgery and said, Oh, I'm sorry, your husband has testicular cancer. It was like a shock uh, beyond shock. I mean, at at any rate. Wow. uh, And wait, and you were, how how old were you? I, uh, we were, uh, he was in his late twenties. He was 29. Mm. Wow. uh, Yeah. And, um, at any rate, I didn't know anyone who'd been diagnosed with, cancer at that point. I didn't know. Uh, it, nobody in my family had ever died. Mm, yeah. You know, I had all my grandparents, everything. Right. You were and young so yourself, right? I was young myself. And, and you I had t- two little kids. We had the kids were one. Uh, my son had just celebrated his first birthday and my daughter had just turned four wow, when okay. they were diagnosed mm-hmm. when he was diagnosed. So um, it was a huge shock. And we were, we were so not prepared. I I had an idea of what my life was going to be like. I had a perfect plan and I was on track, you know, I was going to be super mom. I was super mom. I was, we were living in Berkeley and uh, 
there were a lot of super moms in Berkeley and very crunchy back then. This is so early, early seventies, Berkeley. Okay. Early 70s, yeah, I'm like painting 60s, a picture in my yeah, mind yeah, here. Right. right exactly. <laughs> so there was a cross between um, early seventies, um, hippy dippy. And also my new England background, which is very stiff upper lip. Uh, so the, that cross was not necessarily the best. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, and, I was really into the parenting thing. I mean, I had gardened and I made everything from scratch. I sewed their clothes, even the little rompers that they wore with the snaps of the crotch, you know, oh, yeah. I did uh-huh. the whole bit. Wow. And, and my husband had just started his own business. And so he was super busy and we were like ships crossing in the night. And then he was a uh, real stoic. He came from a military family. So he's a real stoic about what he was going through. So it was not a good time communication wise for mm. us. Mm. And um, so about after a year when it looked like it was getting serious, that the treatments were perhaps not working. Um, we did a thing called EST that was popular in the Bay area at the time. They, uh, it was a human potential movement uh, mm. seminar program where the takeaway is to learn or to experience to yourself that what is, is, and, you know, like to deal with it and to, to live to the best of our ability in the present moment, which was very helpful in many ways to live in the present moment when you've got something so horrendous. Mm. But at the same time, uh, my, my chirpy nature just was like, okay, I'm miserable. All right. But the kids are coming in. So chirp, chirp, chirp. And Uh, I I did a lot of chirp and we never, we never talked to the kids about what was going on. We were just like trying to be in the moment with it. And mm. daddy's not feeling well right now, but you know, maybe in a couple hours, he'll come out and play blocks with you. And Mm. I mean, it was, I did not, I did not deal well with it. I'll put it that way. Um, Mm. Uh, and then, uh, and and then uh, the other thing was that I didn't find him attractive in the last year or so of life. I mean, he was he looked terrible mm. and and felt terrible, and so our sex life was kind of a wreck. Mm. Um, and we each had an affair. I mean, it was just mm. it was a mess. It, the yeah. whole. Thing. Mess. And, it, and it was Berkeley and everybody was having a fair, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. So then he died and I was devastated. The kids were, I don't know, they, they, we just sort of went on. Mm. And I allowed myself to be a little bit sad, but not much. And mostly what happened was I was pissed off, I was, mm. was angry. Yeah, I was angry that he left me holding the bag with two little kids. Um, and they were how old when he died? They were they were they had just turned three and six. Okay, right, right. Mm. Uh, my son was the three year old, and my daughter was six. Um, mm-hmm. So we just sort of went on, and. No rituals, no nothing. I mean, it was really, it was looking back, it was really kind of weird, I think. Mm. Maybe not so weird for the time. Maybe not so, no, not so weird for the time, but looking back, it's like, mm. ooh, that I didn't do that very well. And uh. then about six months after he died, I, the anger and the embarrassment and the shame of how I had behaved the last year of his life just took over. And, um, I began eating and dieting. I had been, I had had a weight problem as a teenager and I just went nuts with this dieting and obsessing bit Hmm. and just hating myself, hating, hating, hating myself for being so shallow and so absorbed by this ridiculous problem when my kids had just lost their dad. I mean, Hmm. it just, the self-loathing was, you could cut it with a knife and I, I got to the point where I was seriously considering suicide and uh, just to get away from the pain. Mm. And so a friend said, you know, we need to, to chat. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I had been to a psychiatrist who had said, you know, just pull up your socks and 
you know, wow. get over it. Yeah. And she's like, and I, so this woman was a coach, actually. She was like the first person who ever did coaching. And mm. she said, I want to try my, my process on you. This is your friend now. My friend, Cherie. And so she asked me a bunch of questions about what my vision for the next part of my life was going to be. And I was like, oh, I have no idea. <laughs> right, I mean, right. All I can think about is losing this weight. And she said, well, what if your weight problem was, was the, if the obstacle was the path, essentially, hmm. if, the, if your way out was through. Hmm. And so I thought to myself, well, if I could resolve this weight problem, um, I would share it with everybody. I mean, it would be the greatest gift because this is such a burden. Hmm. And she's like, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> Wait, at this point, think- how, how long had it been since your husband died? Six months or so. Okay, okay. Just trying Something to place like it that. in context here. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and so she said, well, why don't you, you know, create a, a class? And I like... Okay. <laughs> so so I, I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew that I had to stop dieting, that that was making me crazy. So it was going to start by stopping dieting and, or trying to diet or doing all that stuff and being more mindful. It's like, what was I actually doing? What was I eating? How was hmm. I feeling? Hmm. And so I started taking note of those things. And um, then the book that I wrote called The Cherry Pie Paradox the thing that happened next was I had breakfast with a friend who was taking, going to be taking care of my kids that morning. So I could get a little me time Mm. and she was having cherry pie for breakfast Mm. and her, um, her pie, she had just made it and she ate like half of the piece of pie. And then she threw, and I was having black coffee because I was like on a diet sort of uh, uh. uh and she threw half of the piece of pie in the garbage can and I'm like you can't do that homemade pie That's <laughs> homemade pie <laughs> and and you know she's this skinny little thing and I, I I thought you know there's something different about Carol and how she thinks than how I think hmm. I can I am so attached to to food that I would have dived into the garbage can after the, after the pie, uh-huh. uh, you just don't throw away food. And I realized that maybe I'd been studying, you know, fat people. And the, the clue was to study people who were naturally thin like Carol. And so hmm. that was the, that was basically the huge turning point for me was realizing that we all have multiple personalities. We've put it that way. Uh, that that we have good sides and bad sides and um, skillful behaviors and not so skillful and and that I probably I had thought of myself as a fat person even when I was thin hmm. I was always worried that probably I had a thin person in there too and what how could I nurture that that hmm. more positive self so that was what the program was all about at any rate uh, it became a, a big deal in the Bay area f- for the next five years. And then I left to go to graduate school. Um, so, uh, uh, I went on to doing other things and that's how come I didn't write the book for 40 years is because I was doing other things. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that was a long, yeah, no, I? no, that's interesting. Well, and so the, it sounds like was the, it sounds like food and eating and weight had been long-standing issues or it challenges had, and right. it sounds like the grief maybe brought that back or something to the forefront it, right it did it brought it right I mean it brought it back it had been a dabbling thing before you know it was just always kind of on and off a diet and, and then after this I um, I doubled down and doubled down on the craziness I, and I'm I'm very clear now that it was just a way of not thinking about all the feelings I was having. Mm. It was, a, it was a great way to avoid the pain. Mm. Yeah. So. Cause you mentioned kind of just carrying on and not addressing. And I'm wondering about how that, you know, in relation to the kids, then if you like reflections on, 
I don't know if, you know, if you would do something maybe differently, if you went back to do it all over again, not that you obviously would want to do it all over again. Right. But, but yeah, right. your thoughts on how that might've impacted them or, or, or anything. Yeah, I was, uh, for that first year and a half, I'd say after he died, I was so into, uh, first the grief and the pain and the guilt and the shame, uh, and then into this creation of this program that uh, they took back a back seat, uh, really. Mm. Uh, I mean, I was, I was there for them, but I was also always thinking about the classes I was teaching and new angles and so forth. And yeah. they were in on a lot of my experiments. I mean, I, <laughs> I had them doing tasting tests and oh. uh, uh I mean, they were, they were great. They were really, uh, I learned a lot from watching them eat because they were kids who are usually naturally thin themselves. Mm. So there was a lot to, to observe there. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, so in Berkeley, there was this co-op where most of us shopped and there was a bulletin board on the co-op where you could post jobs wanted and so forth, things for sale. And I found uh, an ad for, uh, and I knew I needed help because I was teaching these classes and trying to get the business off the ground. And I had two little kids, no, no family around. They all mm. lived back East. Mm. So, um, I found a listing for a, a guy that wanted to be, a a, a nanny. Oh. And I thought that would be perfect. Ah, tell me more about that. Have, yeah, so I found, well, actually I had two different Mannies. The first one was a, a law student at Cal, and he turned out to be a little bit predatory, and um, that was not a good thing. I mean, he mm. chased me around the oh. kitchen table a few times, and I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> this is not going to work. Uh-huh. But the second, uh, so then I found another guy who wanted to do that, and I really wanted it for my my son in particular to have a man around Mm. and this I had space in the house and this guy was a an elementary school teacher at a nearby school Mm. and uh and so it turned out that he stayed with us for 13 years oh wow (laughs) (laughs) he became a member of the family I mean only for um the first I guess five years was he actually a manny uh-huh. But it was really a wonderful thing, and I would recommend if you're if you're a widowed woman who's missing a man in the house, having men around so important. Mm. Uh, some of my neighbors, uh, their husbands would take my my kids to uh, what was called Indian Guides, I think. Uh, back it was the, the oh, it was a YMCA boy, program, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But but some of the the husbands of my friends took my kids on outings so that they mm. had a man in their lives. But that was a really important thing. And when I f- met my second husband, eight years after my first husband died, um, my son was like, are you going to, can I call you daddy? I was uh, like, heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> he was and he would so, have been about 11 or so at that point. Yeah, that's right. Right. Mm. He was, he was 11. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and that, yeah, so that was very, very sweet. And, and my second husband did a really good job as best he could to, to be a, a father. And he was, he did a good job, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but it's not the same. <sighs> yeah, I wonder yeah. if you have any, any, I guess, thoughts or tips on, yeah, people who are thinking about getting remarried or, I don't know, mm, approaching that or, how, you know, integrating a new partner who is it has maybe a parent role but isn't there the parent of you know the dead parent yeah, of, the, of yeah. the kids well he he did not want to be called dad mm. I mean he he did want to be called dad but but he felt that that would be a dishonor to oh. Edward mm. my first husband and so mm. they called him by his first name instead mm. um I I waited. I, I actually didn't even date for for all those years because I knew that I I had a double duty. One is to find somebody that I resonated with, and also somebody that 
was good with kids. Mm. I mean, I could not have, I couldn't have married somebody who didn't want to take on the kids. Sure. Yeah, sure. And so it's a, it's hard. I mean, I, there was, there was nobody that I felt could do that for all that time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and your second husband didn't have kids. You know. He did not have kids. In fact, he wanted kids of his own. And so I managed to squeeze out one last egg. Oh, <laughs> and, and ha- we had a third child when I was 43. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. So that's exciting. It was exciting. And the, it was interesting because my kids were 12 and 15 when he was born and they were like second parents. Yeah. Uh, so it was very sweet. We were a very close family. And I was going to say, um, so time went on and honestly, they were, it seemed to me like they were super well adjusted. I, they were never problem children, any, any of them, uh, no problems in school. I mean, aside from the usual you mm. know, friend traumas, but, but nothing. Mm. And they were good students and all that. No trouble with the law or drugs or alcohol or anything. And so I'm like, we're home free, <laughs> well-adjusted adults. Why do I sense then, a butt coming here? <laughs> right, there's a butt. <laughs> and they are, they are. And huh. uh, when my son, my older son, um, had his first child, um, which was, so they're now, she's now seven. So seven years ago, mm-hmm. he became super dad. And when I say super dad, I mean, super dad. He was to the point where a few months after uh, his daughter was born, my granddaughter, uh, I kind of took him aside and said, you know, you need to let your wife uh, be part of this process here. (laughs) Yes. I mean, if he could have nursed, he would have, I swear. (laughs) So what do you think was uh, behind that? Or what does he think was behind well, that? So, so we, we talked about it and, and there was no question in his mind that he felt that he had missed having a present dad mm. and he wanted to make sure that wasn't uh, a problem for his own kids. Mm. And so ever since he has taken uh, every birthday, he takes the child child's birthday mm. uh, on a special outing with him. Nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes an overnight camping trip. So his, his relationship with his kids is very tight. I mean, he's, mm. he's let Lara come in and take her part of the responsibility. So it's much better now. But, but he owned up to the fact that he was wanting to make sure that this didn't happen to mm. his kids. Mm-hmm. So, so that's him. And then my daughter uh, was sort of gliding along, you know, kids starting off to college and all and has her own business. And then about a year or so ago, her business partner left and had had to move on um, for personal reasons, having nothing to do with the business. And my daughter went into a huge slump, got Mm. really depressed and Mm. decided she needed to see a therapist. And so she started seeing the therapist and uh it was only then that she began to realize that it was like an issue of of abandonment that her partner Mm. had left and abandonment was a big deal and much bigger deal than she thought and and the the therapist um is retiring at the end of this year and she was she kept telling heather that uh you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be retiring uh, soon. And Heather's like, yeah, okay, I understand. And, it's like, and then a couple of weeks later, you know, I'm going to be retiring soon. And then a couple of weeks later, you know, did I tell you I'm going to be retiring soon? Uh-huh. And she's like, what is all this about you're going to retire? And she said, oh, well, you know, um, I didn't want to, I want to warn you ahead of time because, yeah. you know, you're susceptible to the feelings of loss when somebody important mm-hmm. leaves interesting yeah and she might feel she, abandoned again I, I, right and even though and these, obviously like her dad didn't abandon her on purpose it was you know it's out of his control 
right. and the business partner and the therapist. I mean, none of those are right, but that's so right. interesting. Right. And so obviously these things have repercussions for long, long after. And um, I don't know if you've read the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Well, it's on my list to read. People keep telling me about it and how yeah, it is. I, you, you well, so Ezra, about Klein, it. In, Ezra Klein interviewed the author hmm. um, last week, I think. Oh, well, uh, recently uh-huh. in, on his podcast on the New York Times. And he talked about the um, impact of early trauma. Mm. You know, he, his specialty was PTSD or is PTSD, but PTSD comes in many forms. It's not just soldiers in uh, war torn areas. What you think of yeah, first, what right? You think. But, but, but it happens to many, 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 many millions of people in their young years. And, mm. and the response lingers for a long time. And what he was saying is that talk therapy is, goes only so far. And drug therapy goes only so far. Uh, he called it alcohol therapy, but he, he meant anything uh, that changes, you know, uh-huh. because the, the body never forgets. And that, that pain is visceral and uh, needs to be dealt with sometimes in other ways. Uh, he suggested things like MDMA, which is a ecstasy, I think it is. And okay. EMDR, which is the rapid eye, mov- mm. rapid eye movement. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Psychedelics and and also movement in community, whether it's singing in community or hmm. um, uh, yoga classes in community, but just being in community with other people. And so a 12-step program or listening to a podcast about widowhood with other widows, mm-hmm. all of that kind of centering you on, on another way to look at your reality that that was fixed back there in that time. Mm. So painfully, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Interesting. I, yeah, I need to read that book soon here. It keeps, you know, I I keep having to read books coming up. Yeah. Well, and I keep having to read other books for people I'm interviewing. So, you know, things, other things keep sliding down the list. (laughs) I know. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. No, that's terrific. Well, I wonder, yeah, it's an interesting question, right? Because I think I heard, you know, you were saying it seemed like in all those years, things were going fine. Things seemed smooth. Right. And, and I've interviewed other people who, you know, one woman whose mom died when she was 19, I think. And, you know, she went like super achiever mode, heads down, do great in college, p- career, family, go, go, go. And then when she was turning 43, which was the year her mom died, she started to get all these physical symptoms, speaking of the body keeping the score, right? All these unexplained things, right? And every MRI and every test and everything was like, there's nothing wrong with you. And yet she had all, right? And so it was catching up um, to her and they finally figured out that it was grief and she did therapy and, you know, and that ended up being very helpful. But, and so I wonder, you know, I'm thinking about parents um, with kids, you know, now today, I don't know when your kids were small. I don't think that these grief programs existed uh, if they did, I didn't know about it. And we, I remember uh, in the last like two weeks of Edward's life, and he he died at home, and he so he was in our bed, mm. and um, we were Kaiser members at the time, and uh, they sent a social worker out like a week before he died to talk with me about this whole thing. And that hmm. was kind of like, she might've come out twice and that was it. Wow. Uh, hmm. And I remember being surprised, like, what are you doing here? You know, you're yeah. not the hospice nurse. And she's like, well, I thought, you know, maybe you'd like to talk. Or, huh. Huh. And did you, so, uh, you didn't realize that the end was close at that point, but maybe she oh, did. No, I or, did. Oh. no, we knew, we knew the end was close, Okay, but, but it just, it surprised me that, that somebody who was a, psychologist or a social worker would come out to see mm-hmm. me. I, I don't, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was in another land. I yeah. don't know. And, and she didn't have, she didn't, they didn't send someone out to talk to the kids or anything. There was no like kids grief support. No, kind of stuff. no, I don't remember that. Yeah. I don't remember that. Mm. And, and so my daughter was at a birthday party, uh, when he died 
she was, and the babysitter brought her home just as the undertaker was wheeling oh, no. my husband's body out with, oh, the claw, no. with a sheet over his uh, face. And she's, and I said, you know, your dad died. And she's like, oh, uh, let me see him. And so the undertaker pulled the sheet back and she goes, oh yeah, that's him. All right. Wow. And, and she was that, like six, right? She was like, she was just turned. She had turned six, like two a week before. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of it. Yeah. I, I st- I'll never forget that. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like yeah. a six-year-old response. You yeah, know? It, it does. Very matter of it fact. Does. Right. It probably yeah. haunted her, though, for a long time, right? I, yes. Yeah. So, anyway, my daughter and I, since since I decided that, that I might be an interesting guest for your podcast, my daughter and I have been talking oh. and have decided that we really, uh, my son has been not able i haven't been able to reach him in the last week for a variety of reasons but he he lives in france oh uh that the three of us need to have some conversations and maybe do some rituals together to mm-hmm. kind of bring the circle around mm-hmm. to talk about the things that we have never talked about because mm-hmm. they s- seemed like it was over yeah but it's clearly not over yeah uh, and it's been you know, 47 years. Yeah. That's terrific. I mean, I love that, you know, it's not, it's never too late to have these conversations, to talk about difficult things to talk about things that haven't been talked about. Um, And hopefully with 47 years of time passing, you know, you guys will feel free to talk and not, you know, I, I, I can imagine, you know, if somebody's having some of these harder conversations and that, it's much closer to the time people might not be as comfortable, right? Sometimes when a lot of right. time goes by, yeah. you're like, all right, let's just talk about it, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, I, I'm grateful that, that my daughter was, was willing mm. and thought it would be a, good, a really good idea. And I'm, I'm excited to talk to Ethan, my son, about it yeah. as well. Good, good. Uh, That's terrific. Uh, I'm happy for you. Yeah. And uh, I, I feel really... Um, bad that I didn't I, I know I did and they know I did the best I could at the time mm. but still I wish yeah. I'd done differently I yeah. really do uh, yeah. and um, yeah well that's and so that's well what am I trying to say here you know I think um, we're all doing the best we can right and yeah. what is it they say when you learn better, you do better or something or when, yeah, you, that, that works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh-huh. so um, I wonder for people listening, you know, are there a couple of things you have in mind that, you know, if you had known X or Y or Z, you wish you had done something. Yeah. yeah. So I w- wish that we had talked openly about his illness and mm-hmm. what was possibly and perhaps likely to happen. I wish we had talked about that at their level and right. perhaps we would have, you know, ideally we would have had a therapist help us mm. figure out how to, how to do that. And then after the death, if they could have been in a grief group of some sort, you know, making, I know there's groups now, the Dougie, is it the Dougie? The Dougie Center in Portland. Dougie yeah, Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. that does grief groups for kids and, you know, the sand castles and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. That would have been so helpful. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I wish I had, there's no, nothing I could do now, but, but yeah. I, I, so I, but I, for others, I, I would wish that they did therapy um, and had somebody to talk to joined a grief group. Mm. Because everyone's experience is different, and it would have been really helpful for me to know that I wasn't the only parent or wife who was pissed off mm. or yeah. or or ashamed or guilty. Mm. Um, that would have been really helpful to know. Mm. Um, 
And maybe if I had been the only one in the group that felt that way or that said that I felt that way, there would have been somebody else in the group of, oh, my God, I, too, am pissed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, help. Get help. <laughs> and, and ask for help. I, I was such a stiff upper lipper. I just, I, I hated asking for help. I hated feeling dependent on other people. And when um, my friends would take the kids for the weekend, so I had a break, I, I felt guilty. I felt like I owed them something. Mm. And I finally figured out I, I cannot pay them back at this time. But in the future, when somebody else needs this kind of help, I can do that. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't now. So I, I have to pay it forward. Right. Well, and yeah. even coming here and sharing, right, with listeners. Right. I mean, you're paying it That's forward here too. That's my yeah, hope. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that the things you've just said here are really important for listeners to to hear. You know, your perspective 47 years out, wishing that that you had, you know, known about talking with the kids while your husband was sick. Um and talking with them after and the grief support and all those things that weren't available, um, you know, now, I think in the last 20 years, the, the field of you know, children's grief has really come together. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there are programs like the Dougie Center in many, many communities across the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, the Dougie Center on their website has a lookup tool. So ah. even if you're not in Oregon, go to Dougie.org. And you can put in your own zip code wherever you are, some other state, and find the programs that are near you um, for Excellent. listeners. Yeah, um, I think that's so. Thank you for sharing all that, and I'm glad you shared that. You know, you're having these conversations now. You know, in the coming weeks or months or whenever you guys talk, that it's 47 years later. It's not too late to yeah um, talk with your never- kids and have these conversations. And and 47 years later that that I too am finally realizing, Oh, yeah, <laughs> this had some impact on me besides uh, the whole thin within weight, weight war business, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. you know? And I think uh, a lot of people may not have turned to food, but, you know, turned to drugs or alcohol to soothe the feelings and mm-hmm. uh, other addictive behaviors it's, mm-hmm. i think There's it's pretty common coping mechanisms that yeah you know, some more healthy than right. others right <laughs> yeah right yeah uh but the the one thing that surprised me i think is that i i survived you know that we survived that oh. that um that i'm stronger i'm much stronger than i ever was mm. uh, you know i know that i can live on my own, that I can care for my kids, or that I could care for my kids, Uh that I'm much more creative than I thought. So I think if I had just continued on the same path as a, as a wife, uh, with a side gig, you know, I mean, I I was born in 1940. So, (laughs) you know, I, I come from the June Cleaver kind of, uh, family background right, right. I, I was trying to break out of it but still right uh, yeah, yeah it was a different time right different expectations totally. were different roles you know yeah. yeah and uh so i learned a lot and i i know that i can kind of do i can roll with the punches now i've rolled with a bunch of punches actually and since and yeah come out on top yeah or or yeah, but I think the other thing that I would have counseled myself is that you know you think of your life as having a certain trajectory, you know, mm. based on what your past was, you know, your the, your family of origin and all that. You expect that it's going to go keep going in that direction more or less. Mm. Um, you know, some wobbles here and there, but but you can imagine what it would be like down the road. 20 30 years and uh and i just was unexpected i I was unprepared for a radical break in my reality Mm. Uh, and so uh i would i would counsel people to take improv classes oh interesting oh tell me more about that 
because that's a, that's about dealing with what comes your way and accepting it as a as a gift essentially. Ah. Um, um, I discovered this book late in, oh maybe in the, I think shortly after it came out. I'm not sure when it was. It was called Improv Wisdom by hmm. a woman named Patricia Madsen, hmm. and it's a little book of ma- maxims, like 13 maxims. She's a Buddhist, and a, she was the drama teacher at Stanford, very hmm. popular improv teacher. Hmm. And those maxims ha- have really um, helped me be more flexible and roll with the punches because hmm. life is all about punches and the unexpected. Yeah. Huh. Well, that sounds interesting. I'll see if I can find the link to that and put it in the, in the show notes in case yeah, people want to yeah. check out that, that book. And- yeah. And so I took, I took improv classes. Oh, um, you did? Yes, I did. And made a total fool of myself, <laughs> which is a good thing to do. You know, uh-huh. I mean, I'm not very good at it, but I learned uh-huh. a whole lot. Was this That's more recently or was this back in the seventies uh, or like, no, when? no, no, no. This was in the, this was in the last, um, 10 years, five years. Oh. Uh-huh. Uh, ten, 10 years uh, off okay. and on. Yeah. Nice. But it's the, it's a skill that everyone should have because life is change. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the one consistent thing. Oh, what a terrific idea. That actually sounds like fun. Maybe I'll look into that. I recommend it. Yeah. It is fun. It's be- fun and just be willing to be a total jerk. <laughs> I'm wondering about improv classes for, for teenagers or, or even children oh, yeah. as well. Oh yeah. Oh yes, for sure. Hmm. For sure. Hmm. Cool. Well, now I have something else to put on my list to look into. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's awesome. Yeah, there's, Good. There are great improv groups in, in Seattle uh-huh. and Portland. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully with, with, you know, who knows what's happening with COVID with what's available and not available and all that. But at some point, I assume that, you know, there'll be offerings that are mm-hmm. in person and um, something that sounds like fun, fun way to get out of yeah. the house. Yeah. 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 Well, the first rule of improv is to say yes, mm. uh, to say yes, and, and so to accept what is coming at you, and then roll with it to take it. Gotcha. Further. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. cool. So, well, that sounds fun. Gosh, I think yeah. we could keep talking to you all afternoon here. I think it's, <laughs> you know, it's great. It's really great to talk to someone who has so many experiences to reflect on, right? And, and, uh, and a long time horizon of reflection, I think, adds more, mm, what was the word I'm looking for? I don't know, more potential for, for reflection and, and, and depth and integrating life experiences into, you know, thoughts at this point on this topic. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, I'm rambling, but, but it's a long way of saying thank you for sharing your wisdom with us here today. I think that, I think that listeners will learn a lot from, from hearing your story and your reflections. I hope so. I hope so. And um, I'm, I'd be glad to, to talk to anyone who wants to reach out. Uh, yeah. Well, before I ask where people can reach you, let me ask one wrap up question. If you don't mind, if you could say one yeah. thing to newly widowed parents, what would you say to them? Uh, one thing I would say three <laughs> things. Okay. Three get, things that works. Get help um, or ask for help uh, and take it. And it gets better and take an improv class. <laughs> okay. All right. Perfect. Well, I think that's a great place to end. So my guest today is Joy M. Bowden, Overstreet. So Joy, where can listeners find you if they'd like to learn about your new book that's out here? I think just recently, um, where can they find your book and, and connect with you if they'd like to connect? So the book is The Cherry Pie Paradox, The Surprising Path to diet freedom and lasting weight loss and you can find out more about it at uh, my website which is strangely enough joyoverstreet.com okay perfect and that would be a great place for people to connect and find your social media and everything yes right right i mean i have i'm i'm in a bunch of places yeah but that's a good start yeah great all right well joy thank you so much for speaking with me today thank you so much for for having me i appreciate what you're doing 
I hope you enjoyed my interview with Joy and Bowden Overstreet as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 105. And I hope you will take some inspiration from our discussion and think about any conversations that maybe you've been meaning to have with your kids or thinking that you might want to, wondering if it's too late or kicking yourself for not having yet. And go ahead and have those discussions now uh, rather than putting it off any longer. And if you need some help with that, some suggestions, some help navigating uh, how you might have those discussions or what you might say, do check out the Grief Support Center uh, lookup tools. Both the Dougie Center at Dougie.org has a tool where you can put in your zip code and look for programs near you. And the National Alliance for Children's Grief at childrengrieve.org. They have a support lookup tool as well where you can look by location and look for something in your state or city. And shout out today to all of our listeners in Oregon in honor of today's guest who was joining us from Oregon. Very glad you're here. I hope that if you're in the Portland area, you check out the Dougie Center. And if you're not in the Portland area, do look for something in your community because it can be really helpful for kids and adults to be able to connect with others who have lost a parent um, and who can kind of get, you know, get what's going on. And remember, listeners of the podcast always get a special 15% discount on my book, Future Widow. The ebook, if you buy directly from me at jennylisk.com slash ebook and use the code listener15, that's listener15, in the shopping cart for 15% off the ebook, Future Widow. There are also signed copies of the hardcover available on my online store as well. So go to futurewidowbook.com for all your buying options. As always, thank you for listening, and until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.